Welcome back to the Thinking Critical Comic Book Podcast. It's time for a Comic Writing 101. We've got Professor Aaron Sparrow and Professor Mark Pellegrini in the house to talk about networking comics and building your audience. This is very important stuff, especially, Aaron, if you're an introvert and you don't like to make friends all that much. Oh, well, the, I don't know anything about that. I am the, <laughs> I am the most deplorable uh, version of an extrovert you'll ever meet. Absolutely. How about you, Mark? Do you find networking difficult? There are no friends in comic books. It's like baseball. No crying in <laughs> baseball. There's no friends in comic books. Yeah, so this is, this one should be fun. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about. It looks like we've got a few people in here looking to talk about networking. I've got a couple of quotes I wanted to talk about. But first, let's talk about the importance of networking. Networking allows you to maintain key relationships with other creators, editors, and industry decision makers to grow your presence, improve your skills, stay aware of industry trends, discover new opportunities, collaborate with peers, and most importantly, get hired to do some things. I've got a couple of uh, quotes, like I mentioned earlier. Networking is a deposit in the bank of your future and in your startup. It won't happen immediately, but if you do it right, you will continue to receive its dividends for years. That's from Charlene Walters. Aaron, what that means is just because you, you haven't started writing your comic book yet, if you want to get into the industry, you're going to have to start networking before your product's ready. Oh, that's absolutely right. Uh, years before I ever uh, put pen to paper or uh, you know sat down to type a script, uh, I was going to comic conventions. I was meeting people. You know, I was getting involved in the industry. And then the way that I got into comics itself was uh, I, I had met enough people that I was recommended for a copy editing position at Tokyo Pop. And so that's that's how I got into the industry. And from there, branched out into you know full blown editing and, and writing. Mark, when did you start getting into to networking as far as going out there on the, the convention scene and getting your name out there as somebody that maybe wanted to well, make uh, comic books? Well, this is a, since this is a comic writing 101 stream, and if you're a writer and you have no artistic talent, the sad news is that you are going to have to network if you want to find an artist because that's just the nature of it. Um, I was lucky in that um, I knew Tim, uh, Tim Lim, way back uh, even before I, I started publishing any writing professionally because we both worked for the same website company. Um, so I got to meet, uh, so I got to know an artist before I, I even started um, being a, a professional writer. Uh, but getting out into the convention scene, we started doing that, uh, geez, back in 2013 or 2014. And the first time we did it, we did it um, as part of We Love Fine. So We Love Fine was a, um, and they still are, uh, they're a merchandising company who has licenses with Lucasfilm and Marvel and Disney and uh, Hasbro. So um, Tim and I did these designs for t-shirts and for lunchboxes and merchandising for Transformers and Star Wars and, and Marvel Comics and things. And as part of We Love Fine, we went to conventions with them and worked the We Love Fine booth at these conventions. But uh, when we had free time, we were able to network and go to um, the artist alleys and things and see first to see like how other artists did their booths and artist alleys, then get to talk and meet and, and get to know all these other artists who we still know today. And then we started doing our own booths in the artist alleys. And then we started getting invited to conventions and they were giving us booths. Um, but it all kind of grew from there, uh, essentially. All right. So this is the second quote. This one's from Michael Saldell. This one might be even more relevant, if I'm being completely honest here, uh, Mark. Try never to be the smartest person in the room. And if you are, I suggest you invite smarter people or find a different room. Me. Oh, thank God, because I've... <laughs> Never been the smartest person in the room in my life. <laughs> you don't want to be taking, you know, maybe comic writing um, advice from somebody that's less successful than you. You want to be yeah. networking with people that are where you want to go. Well, you also, if you're going to take comic book writing advice, make sure that you take it from a comic book writer. <laughs> um, there's going to be a lot of artists um, who will give you writing advice, a lot of editors, um, a, a lot of uh, publishers who will give you writing advice, a lot of executives who will give you writing advice, but look at, at um, their bibliography and see how much they've actually written themselves. Um, a lot of them have no writing experience, but a lot of uh, people have this condescending attitude like, well, I can edit, or well, I can draw, or well, I can publish. Um, so that means that I know more about writing than these people do because that's lower down the totem pole than I am. And then a lot of those people make just terrible asinine decisions and pass them off onto you as wisdom. Um, and then you end up learning the wrong things. So yeah, if you're if you're going to be um, not necessarily the smartest person in the room, but if you're going to be in a room full of people who are giving you advice, who are um, who are telling you what you should do if you want to succeed as a comic book writer or in the industry, uh, just make sure that they are experts on the topic they're professing to be experts on. 
Yeah, some people in the industry are not uh, are not examples as much as they are cautionary tales. <laughs> uh, I do want to say though, Mark, your uh, your origin story. Um, I, I find it uh, less interesting than my origin story, where you and Tim Lim were uh, childhood friends and went on Tom Sawyer slash Huck Finn type adventures. <laughs> That was, that's yeah, we, <laughs> we went up and down the Mississippi. We had um, uh, we, we use a lot of language that we're that we're not allowed to repeat anymore. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh yeah, and and Rush did this really awesome song about us. Just check it out. Absolutely. <laughs> so, Aaron, what are you? What are your thoughts on when you're looking to network and you find somebody that maybe you you, you know you're impressed with what they've done? You're they're where you want to get. You want to take yourself on, and hopefully they'll, they'll they'll be your mentor as far as your network. I mean, you can definitely you can definitely pursue that. It's it's kind of a uh, it, it, things have kind of changed in the industry. Whereas uh, you know, it, it's not as easy to get in. It's you know, writers tend to be like handpicked now, so it's not exactly the same as, as when we were networking and and trying to get in. Uh, it's a lot different. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of stories this week about uh, people who tried to network by trying to. Uh, you know, entice, uh, <laughs> entice and get into relationships with creators and how uh, mm. that is uh, absolutely backfired and, and uh, been a disaster. So, yeah, there's a lot of lot of things to avoid when you're, uh, you know, when you're out there. Uh, the best thing to do, I think, is just try to be genuine, try to be genuine about what you want and what you, uh, you know, what it is that you expect from, you know, these creators when you approach them. Uh, you know, if you're asking for advice or, you know, just be, be very clear. Don't... Uh, don't come at people with, you know, hidden ulterior motives because, you know, people pick up on that and it, it feels very sleazy. So, it, you know, it's best to just be upfront and say, you know, hey, you know, I'm really looking for advice to get in. You know, what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of experiences did you have? People love to talk about themselves. So they'll tell you about their experiences night and day and, you know, just kind of take what you can from that. Um, but definitely, uh, you know, avoid coming off like you're trying to use people. Uh, you know, you want to you want to be genuine in your love for comics and your desire to get in without, uh, you know, without coming across as, as underhanded. Absolutely. And network is all about people skills. It's about building relationships and keeping them and, and then, uh, you know, growing your network and, and getting better over time. So let's talk about putting yourself out there. This is probably going to be the hardest part for a lot of people, including I believe Mark <laughs> would consider himself an introvert. There yeah. are key resources and events events perspective, and even seasoned creators need to be involved in to grow, maintain their industry presence. Comic book conventions is an enormous one once those kind of come come back online. Social media groups, there are definitely private groups where you can go in there, you can talk about comic book writing, you can improve your craft, you get to know what jobs are even out there. Professional sites such as DeviantArt, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, those are going to be ones that you maintain yourself. And then you know, like writer workshops and stuff like that. Aaron, where are some of the places you put yourself out there that have, have produced the most dividends as far as opportunities in the industry or best relationships? For me, it was comic conventions, uh, you know, San Diego in particular. Uh, I was involved with uh, that convention for a number of years uh, behind the scenes. So I met a lot of people and, you know, over a few years realized that, you know, wow, I, you know, I've got enough contacts now. I could probably really make a go of this. Up until that point, I knew that I wanted to get into comics. I, I wanted to write comics. Uh, I, I didn't necessarily want to do it as, as a living because I knew that that was, uh, you know, probably a fool's errand. But I definitely wanted to do it as a hobby. And so I, I realized I had enough contacts. And uh, so I just started like reaching out and asking if there were any jobs available. And that's eventually how uh, I, I found the job at Tokyo Pop. And then once you're in there and you're working with creators, you're working with editors and you, know, you really start to get an even stronger network of people because what happened was eventually Tokyo Pop kind of ran aground financially and the editors all scattered out into the industry. And then I started getting work outside of you know, Tokyo Pop because people that I knew had gone to other companies and, you know, knew what I could do and, and liked me and liked what I did. So, you know, I got a lot of jobs that way. Well, Mark, did you have any other experiences where you kind of put yourself so, out there and started getting these good relationships going? Well, so I'm definitely, um, like you said, I'm, I'm introverted. I'm not a type A personality. So going to the conventions is fun and meeting a lot of those people, but also, um, you know, like, it's fun to talk to them casually about comics, about the things you love, um, and, to, and to get advice from them. But like um, Aaron said, you know, you don't want to come across like you're like, oh, hey, by the way, could you give me the email address for your editor? Or hey, do you know such and such as phone number? You don't. You come across like that, and um, and then they they can see right through that. And you don't want to be that guy. Um, we when we do conventions, we have people come across come up to us, and they have like a, a nice conversation where we think we're having a nice conversation when it turns out that they're just trying to butter us up to ask us a question. Like, 
you know, schmoozing. And then it turns out like, hey, by the way, we're, we're indie comics creators. We don't know anybody. Um, so we can't get you in, in at Marvel or DC or Image if that's what you're asking about. Um, and if you're asking got us an about Indiegogo it. Indiegogo yeah. that's, that's 14 days from being over. We're not going to get funded. How can you help it? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, people, you know, people ask us just personal, like not not personal questions, but questions about crowdfunding and things like that. You know, we can give them advice on that. But if they're asking us for contacts, you know, they're going to find a dead end with us. You know, especially we've had people come up and ask us if we know anybody at Image, and we're like, do you really know who we are? Because we've never published anything in Image. Um, but for me personally, I found that for the introverted types. Uh, social media um, is actually a very powerful tool for networking, for getting to know people, for making friends, and for making um, uh, fans of your work, for, for building your customer base. Um, it's a lot easier for me to hide, a, hide behind this um, hand puppet avatar and talk to people than for going and trying to shake their hand and talk to them in person. I can do that just fine um, because I, I worked um, you know, in, in retail for 10 years, kind of forced to be you know, um, extroverted, but that's not my natural state. Uh, but on social media, you know, I've, I've met a lot of people, met a lot of friends. I've gotten to know like Aaron here and you. I met you guys through social media. That's how I got to know you. I haven't met you guys at conventions. Um, I have friends who I, I don't even know where or when I met them. It feels like I absorbed them into my timeline, like Douglas Ernst, um, the creator of Soul Finder. Um, I've known him for years and I can't for the life of you tell, tell you where or how I met him. Um, but he's reviewed scripts for me. I reviewed scripts for him. You know, he's been a, a great source of feedback. Um, and also promotion, just knowing him. He's just networking that just happened naturally. Uh, Doug Garrett, uh, he's, he's a musician, but he was a friend of ours that Tim and I knew online. And it just so turns out that he happens to be a very talented musician. And so he's done theme songs for us for Common America for our, our Indiegogo, and we did a, a, a soundtrack CD for Common America. Um, we just meet all these people who are creative types just um, by virtue of them being in our social circle. And then we end up being able to to work to network and, and work with each other and help each other out. Uh, so, Mark, with, with all the, the work that you're doing there, I, I mentioned writers workshops earlier. I know a lot of writers swear by them. I've heard some horror stories. Did you ever find like a, a was it really valuable as far as networking or is that just for honing your skills? Writers workshops. I mean, I've, I've attended a few, uh, but they were more like lecture courses and they weren't any good for networking at all because you're, you're just sitting in a crowd of people or on, you know, on a Zoom conference or, or a live stream, I guess, like, like these, sorry people, but uh, they're not necessarily great for, when people think networking, they think contacts, they think getting to know people. And while um, being part of that, uh, especially in the chat, I mean, yeah, that helps. Um, there's a lot of people in the chat that I know, but I also know them from social media, so they know where to find me on social media. So yeah, I think writers' workshops um, online are actually useful for networking. Um, if you can uh, talk to people directly through the chats and, and get your, your name out there and, and learn where to find them on social media. Uh, the old fashioned type of workshops, which is what I was thinking of immediately when, when you mentioned that, because um, I'm, I'm 35 and I still think it analog sometimes. Um, I've been to those where, you know, you're sitting in like a lecture hall while the person is talking. And while um, sometimes they're informative and useful, they're not informative for networking because obviously you're not uh, getting to meet people on social media and you aren't getting, um, you aren't following people. It's just kind of like they're talking at you and you get, you absorb the information and then you leave. Uh, but these live streams, um, I think that there are, are very useful and Zoom conferences and some of the ones that, that are offered online. Yeah. So, Aaron, I've met a ton of people that have helped me out with my, my YouTube channel. Obviously, this isn't writing comic books, but it is networking. And I've, I've met you. I've met Mark all through social media for the channel. And we end up collaborating and end up getting, uh, you know, I can't help Aaron Sparrow write a comic book because he's a much better writer than me. But I can help him promote it or get some marketing out there. So those kind of, uh, of contacts are important as well. Well, I, you know, I would disagree. I would say that, uh, I mean, I would agree with your second point, but I think that you could help me write a comic book because, number one, uh, I think that everybody needs editorial feedback. I think that when you're working on a story, you can get too close to the subject matter. You can miss plot holes. You know, there's all kinds of things that you can uh, you can miss. So I like to have a group of friends who uh, I know are discerning comic book readers and, and who look for, you know, themes and, you know, know the structure of story and 
that I can pass off a script to and say, hey, what do you think of this? And they can come back and they can tell me, you know, give me like real genuine critique on, on the way that the story played out for them, how the pacing is, you know, did I get the point across? Were the things that needed to be subtle, subtle? Were the things that needed to be overt, overt enough? You know, these are all things that you could help me with. So I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the networking gives you a pool of people, you know, even if they're not necessarily writers themselves yet, or, you, you know, they've, been part of the medium forever and they love comics and they know how comics uh, should read and they know what they like. So it's, uh, it's always good to have people to run things by. Absolutely. It's also good to have people to, you know, they can amplify your, apply your message and, and let people know that you're out there. Now let's get into using social media. This is almost, you know, this is something is, is as important as, uh, as almost anything else in networking anymore. You have to be on social media. You have to be using these platforms and connecting with potential customers and employees via social media is a must in today's environment. With some creative marketing and promotion, uh, creators have the opportunity to connect with more people for less money than any time in history. But there are some rules. You need to be keeping your professional sites up to date. You, you don't want people to go to your, you know, AaronSparrow.com, and the last entry in there was from five years ago. It looks like maybe he's not working anymore. Are you, you telling me you're not you're not enjoying my GeoCities website? <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> You want to make sure your contact information is current. What if somebody wants to hire you and you've got a, an email that you stopped using three years ago? Oh, you want to keep your activity to promotion engagement for the most part. Engagement can be having fun and everything. But, uh, you know, if it's a professional uh, social media site or, or a professional website, you're going to want to keep it, you know, about promotion of your, and engagement of your actual works. And also, like, posting work in progress photos and commentary is really important to let people know what you're working on. And really engaging them, let them know that your next project's coming out, Mark. I know you're always working on something. Yeah, I mean, while Tim is drawing the current book, I'm always writing the next one. And then when I'm done writing the next one, Tim's done drawing the current one. So then we can trade and go back and forth. I'm always one step ahead of him. Um, but some, I know it's, it's difficult because uh, especially if you're writing something that's going to be published later in an ongoing story where people are invested in the narrative and they don't want spoilers, um, that can... Uh, handicap what you can share with people, um, especially as a writer. Now, as an artist, you can share like a a zoom in of a panel, and and people will be really impressed. And like, ooh, the the mystery, et cetera, et cetera. As a writer, it's not like you can um, show a screen cap of your of your word document, you know, and show that to people because that's going to be full of spoilers and stuff. Or it's just a bunch of text that's not very interesting. Um, but there's still stuff that you can you can do to um, promote your work and get it out there. Uh, we commission a lot of art from um, artists, and we publish those. Like I, I just commissioned one from a very talented artist today, um, Sonofuki, and posted that today of our character Common Victory, and that's gotten um, a lot a lot of feedback, and people love it. It's it's great art. Um, so even as a writer, you can you can do things to uh, visually promote your art, and that's also networking because now we we have a rapport with this this very talented um, artist whom we can commission uh, pin up some promotional art from, um, and that's that's all part of the networking deal. Um, with social media, though, like you said, there is uh, um, you, you do have to behave yourself. Now, do you want to go on social media and have everybody hate your guts, like like a Mark Wade or a Dan Slott or something, or do you want to go on social media and actually be liked and have pleasant experience with people? Yeah, you can sell maybe other uh, folks with the heel persona. It can be you part can, of your um, but you can also <laughs> lose a lot of sales if if you uh, go on as a heel. You're I think not very of, good um, with it. I think, I think of Aubrey he... Sitterson, who, uh, who who's very much a wrestling fan, and he wanted to be the heel on all of his social media and just make everybody hate his guts. And where has that gotten him necessarily? Um, well, he, he did a face turn, doing... and people like him now. Yeah, are, do they? I. That's the thing. I'll never trust that guy. If he's insincere on social media and I can't get a feel for his actual personality, his actual persona as a human being, then that makes me distrust him, and that doesn't make me really want to read his stuff. Um, I, when I go on social media, I'm very genuine. I posted a picture last night to let everybody know that I was watching Ghoulies and enjoying it because I don't kind of get, care if people think Ghoulies is stupid. I mean, you know, it, go online and talk about the things you like. People will get a better feeling for your personality. And even if they don't like Ghoulies, they might like you because I think you're a sincere person who's passionate about the things you love. Um, I try to thank everybody who uh, who backs Common America and posts about it on social media. I do a search for Common America, um, even if they don't tag me, just so I can say thank you. Uh, I really appreciate and let them know. Uh, just and I and I do. I really appreciate anybody who backs our books. Um, you can have a positive social media presence. You don't have to be the heel or the jerk, and that can benefit you in all sorts of ways. Aaron, do you search yourself? 
You do, don't you? Say what? I no, I actually don't. I, I, I really uh, don't care. Like, unless people tag me, you know, I, I kind of got a bad taste in my mouth for even the idea of that. Like, it, it had not really occurred to me. And then I had a friend, uh, uh, her name was Ava. She worked at a comic book shop. We'd never met face to face, but we, we were like Facebook friends through a mutual friend. And she was telling me how she said something about not enjoying a book that Dan Slott did. She didn't tag him and that he found her and started harassing her on social media. And I was just like, what, how, I just thought that was the lamest thing in the world to be searching yourself and, and trying to get into fights with people <laughs> that like something that you did, like that didn't even tag you. I don't, you know, I don't have any interest in, in hunting people down, you know, um, when we were doing Darkwing, I, I would do searches for Darkwing Duck, and then I would see if you know people were talking about the comic. And I would do like Mark did, where I would try to, you know, hey, thank you so much for picking it up. You know, people who didn't tag me. And uh, you know who John Wesley but... Ship is? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah he's the Flash. Flash in the 90s. <laughs> he was the original Flash on the TV show. He's also Dawson's father in Dawson's Creek. And a couple of years ago, I was just tweeting him. You know, I love that show, and I was talking about how uh, Dawson's dad, played by John Wesley Ship, I didn't add him or nothing. And I was like. What a, what a great character development. He was like one of the most developed characters by the end of the series. He came back and he said, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. <laughs> you know, nice. um, I I was posting <laughs> just a random Ghostbusters tweet um, a while ago, and I was talking about um, the Ghostbusters, the female Ghostbusters that we do like, that we've always liked. And I mentioned Janine. I also mentioned mm. um, Kylie from Extreme Ghostbusters, who went on to be in the comic because everyone loves Kylie, and an original character from the comic named Melanie Ortiz. But I mentioned Janine. And I got a like and a comment from Laura Summer, the actress who played Janine in the real Ghostbusters, basically saying, and I think she said like, Janine, exclamation point, heart, heart, heart. Like, you know, she was happy that I was talking about her character. And I was like, oh, wow, that's that's really cool. I know she found it because she was basically probably searching Janine Ghostbusters and seeing people were talking about it, but that she's still passionate about her character and she's still pretty nice and, and still very nice to talk to people about it. But like um, Aaron said, you know, I'll search Common America in, in Twitter just to uh, see if people, you know, anybody who backed it and didn't tag me or is talking about it. Um, if I see someone saying like F Common America, I'm like, OK, skipping that one. <laughs> I'll go to the next one. I don't like get into a, a, a freaking fight with them. Like, I swear, the funniest thing that Kevin Smith used to do is that he would search himself on Google every day. And if he found someone in the comment section of some little blog you know, saying like, oh, man, I think Clerks 2 sucked. He would just get into a fight with them. He would go on like uh, Comics Alliance and get into fights with Chris Sims over his movies. He would go to like, uh, bound, not Bounding any times, he'd go to um, Any Cool News and get into kind of like, this guy's a, a Hollywood celebrity. He has so much free time on his hands and he's just going and then hyper focusing on anybody who's critical in the comment section of a blog and his movie. Now, it just seems so pathetic, you know? But, you know, that, that's crybaby Kevin Smith. So, <laughs> Well, it is, it, it's... You know, don't you have anything better to do with your time? If somebody comes yeah. and actually tags me and tells me they didn't like something I did, I'll engage with them and I'll be polite and I'll say, oh, you know, what didn't you like about it? Because I think that's that can be a valuable learning experience if the person has something uh, more substantial to say than you suck. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I'm not going to get into a fight with them. Their opinion is their opinion. And if I did something that they didn't like, well, hey, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do something in the future that they do. You know, that's still a potential customer for the future. And the way that you treat them when you engage with them is going to determine whether or not that, you know, they eventually do try something else that you do and like it. So, Aaron, is there any other types of social media besides just like maybe Twitter or Facebook that you found really useful uh, as far as gaining network connections and, and having your your um, a presence out there so people know that you're ready to, to, to write comics, you're ready to edit comics? I don't know. I don't really go out with the attitude of, you know, with my Twitter and things like that. That's because you make five figures a week or you bring home five <laughs> figures a week. God, I bring home five, at least five figures a week. <laughs> but uh, no, no, I just I the way that the industry has kind of churned and the way that you get hired now is not uh, is not something that me as a. Uh, you know, as a straight white male is going to benefit from, uh, you know, that people are looking for diversity for, for these books, you know, whether the people have experience or not. Uh, it, it's more about surface traits than it is your, your actual ability or, uh, you know, talent. There's so, a lack of bald men writing comics right now. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> well, there's one less this week, isn't there? So, <laughs> well, now, now, now I can jump into that spot, which is what all these, all these people think when, when they bring somebody down, that now that spot is open, but that's not the way it works. Uh, no, I, I don't, uh, I don't know. I don't really care about, I don't care if I ever do a Marvel book. I don't, uh, I'd like to do some DC books, uh, but uh, you know, they, they seem on really shaky ground right now. And into the truth is, is that I'm outspoken in a way that you're not allowed to be outspoken in that I approach everything with sincerity. I don't just parrot 
what is being said by, you know, the people in the industry so that I can cozy up to them and get work. I don't believe in that. I believe in being genuine and, and try to be sincere in all aspects of your life. I just find it easier. Uh, you know, it won't get you as much work as being fake, but, uh, you know, you will, uh, you'll have a more <laughs> satisfying life overall. You won't be one of these paranoid, terrified creators afraid that they're going to step out of line and uh, just bring out the long knives and backstab friends as soon as those friends are in some kind of trouble because, oh no, I, you know, I need to keep the mob's focus off of me. I don't want to live like that. And, and if that's what's required to work in the big two or, or uh, you know, get, get work in any of the, you know, the main indie companies, I don't need it. Uh, you know, I can do my own thing. I can put out a creator own book anytime I want. I can come on here and promote it. I can talk to Mark and Tim about it on their channel. Um, you know, you guys will read the script and tell me, you know, no, this is wrong. Do it again. That's what's <laughs> right. Uh, you know, so I, I you don't, the, the truth is, is as far as networking goes, I know that we all want to work on these big characters that we love, but these, these characters are be largely being ruined by big corporations and, uh, you know, editors that don't actually care about the legacy of the characters. So, <laughs> You know, what are you going to do? Are you going to be the person to go on and fix all the damage that Tana Easy Coates did to Captain America? You know, who, who wants that baggage? Create your own thing and, and do a better version of Captain America that is owned by you, that isn't mired by all these uh, all these terrible corporate decisions. A lot yeah, of I people mean, would like, like to do that, Aaron. So specifically what I've been told, I don't know that it's true because I've never tried to get a job in the industry, that if you want to work for DC or Marvel, the specific relationship you need is with the editor. Is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. That's, you know, the editor is the person that uh, that hires you. You know, they have to trust you enough to depend that you're working when they can't keep their eye on you. Uh, you know, you need to have that sort of relationship. The, the big problem with the way it is, you know, people say like, well, how do you break into the industry? It's like voice acting or it's like anything else. You know, it, it all comes down to the networking. It all comes down to people that you've met who take a liking to you and then, you know, are in a position to, uh, you know, to help you out and to, you know, use your talent to help them out. Uh, it's, it's all about very, creating relationships, right? Yeah, Aaron? it's all about creating relationships because the problem that you run into when people think that, yeah, hey, I, I made it, I got a book and now I've broken in. Well, then your editor quits or is fired and leaves. And, and now a new guy comes in who doesn't know you and who's never worked with you and, you know, may be reticent to hand you work because he doesn't, you know, he doesn't know if you can do the job. So, you know, you're always kind of trying to break back in when you're trying to get into those those main comic book companies. Unless, you know, you just are one of those people that just gets handed books no matter how many books you take. Uh, you know, that's <laughs> that's the other <laughs> way. So, you know, it's a, it's a really strange time. It's tough to offer advice to people on how to break in when the the model has has changed to a uh, disastrous one that is uh, you know basically ramming the entire uh, Titanic of the industry into an iceberg. But uh, you know we'll we'll do what we can. <laughs> we'll try to help you. So Mark, you've been networking since you were like a small child, right? Oh yeah, since since I was a wee lad and I got into an autograph from, from shop Jim Lee. owner. <laughs> he's been writing comics since he was like twenty, right? Oh yeah, uh, Michael Tierney. Yeah, he he's so uh, COVID killed um, so many small businesses. All the lockdowns and quarantines last year, and unfortunately, um, Michael Tierney had to shut uh, shut down his shop last year. But he actually he had been planning on retiring for a long time. So I think he just finally got the uh, um, the escape clause he'd been looking for. But he he's been such a great source of stories. He has some great stories about uh, Eric Larson and and someone and it's, they're great stories because he came out on top in his uh, his battle with Eric Larson over um, certain intellectual properties and trademarks. But he's he's been in the industry and he's he's had a, a lot of wonderful uh, back and forth. But he's also a great source of wisdom. Um, now, so a lot of times, you know, you're you're networking, and it's easy to get starstruck. You can meet someone, and it doesn't matter. They they could be someone as big as you know, like oh, I'm in a meeting with Steven Spielberg, or it could be someone. If we're talking comics here, it could be as small as oh, I I'm in a room with the guy who wrote Spider Man in 1995. Oh, it's a big deal to you, you know, because you're maybe you grew up with Spider Man comics in '95 like I did, and so it seems like a big deal, um, even in the the scope and perspective of things. It's pretty small time. Um, but it's easy for for a lot of creators when they're networking for the first time and start um, interacting with um, professionals or people who have a lot more experience than them to get starstruck and maybe miss certain warning signs and, and miss um, you know things that that would seem very obvious in hindsight because hindsight is indeed 2020. Uh, you have to make sure that you don't fall into those traps. And it, it can be difficult where you make bad decisions or maybe you trust someone uh, that you in other circumstances really wouldn't. Um, 
And that can be the pitfall of, of networking is that uh, you don't want to disappoint someone who's a, a big wheel and giving you a shot, you know, like, hey, man, I know that you're an up and comer, but I'm going to give you a chance to prove yourself, you know, and then all of a sudden you're signing a bunch of NDAs and a bunch of contracts that you realize afterward, like, oh, wow, I got screwed. Um, and that, that's usually the, the beginner's mistake that a lot of people make. It, it's so very, very common. Um, but because you're in that position where you don't want to miss a big opportunity or something that seems like a big opportunity, and then you find out um, afterward that it wasn't an opportunity, you were just getting taken for a ride. Uh, and that, well, that's you also always want to yeah. create opportunities with these relationships. I know that's one yeah. of the things that kind of opened up the door to the industry for, for Tim was he was mm -hmm. doing a lot of uh, licensed work for, for uh, T-shirts, I believe. Yeah. And it turns out somebody that was associated with IDW, I don't know if they moved over. They're like, if you're ever interested in comic books, you can come over and do covers. It did. And um, so uh, Tim did covers for geez, did covers for Transformers. Um, he did covers for Ninja Turtles. Um, he, and Back doing covers for IDW uh, even led to doing some covers for Valiant. He did covers for, um, what is it? It's not, it's Bloodshot. He did a cover for Bloodshots. And who was it that did, uh, I think it was Dynamite, he did a cover for them for uh, their James Bond Varger comic. So, I mean, it, it led to a bunch of cover work for a bunch of different publishers. Um, and Tim's more savvy than I am. He, he's, uh, I don't know if he's, he'd call himself an A-type personality, but he's much more better at socializing uh, directly with people and networking than I am. Um, but he was also, he's also more business savvy than I am. That's why he runs pretty much everything that goes on with Common American Black Ops, and I just write the book. Uh, he's a, he's able to detect a lot of these things because he's also had more experience directly with this stuff. Made the mistakes um, himself that I would probably make, you know. So I, <laughs> I, I don't make those mistakes. Um, but yeah, you just you just need to you know if someone's coming off like in any other situation, you would read that person's personality as being uh, a warning sign. Don't. Come, don't say like, oh, well, I, I, this person, I don't necessarily trust them, but I really don't want to pass up this opportunity. So I'm going to make a deal with them. You know, stop yourself right there and just don't make a, a deal back. with someone you don't want to hang out with. Exactly. If it's someone that's giving you all these warning signs, but oh, they sound like they're going to make me rich and famous. I better sign whatever they put in front of me. Don't do that. Uh, that's what a lot of people do. And they end up losing the rights to the things that they created um, a lot. You know, and, and also if you're working for corporate comics, you know, if you have these these brilliant ideas that you've wanted to use for years and years and years, and you think that they're your, your A material, the best thing you've ever come up with, do you really want to use them on a corporate IP for something you'll never own that'll never be yours? Or would you rather use them on a creator-owned property, on something that'll always be yours? And maybe it won't cast as wide a net as a Marvel or a DC or, or whatever book, but it'll always be yours and you'll always be able to uh, build off of it. Whereas your your brilliant ideas um, will, uh, as, as a work for hire, will only ever be owned by the corporation. And when they get um, adapted into a major motion picture by Disney, um, you'll get a special thanks credit buried um, in, in the uh, 10 minute long credit sequence at the end of the movie and that's it. Um, you'll never really benefit from them ever again. No, Ed Brubaker has said that he makes more off of his brief background cameo in the Winter Soldier as a as a scientist, than he does for creating the Winter Soldier. But he has the Winter Soldier <laughs> crafting that storyline. That's, oh, that's, that's sad. How corporate comics works. So I, I'm not saying don't don't you know swing for the fences if you do get a corporate comics job. But just know that any new idea that you bring to the table, any new concept, any new character creation, uh, you're, you're you're not going to benefit from that in the way that that you might think. So it's uh, it's always a good idea to if you've got some original original concepts, you know, hold those for yourself because honestly, I don't think that that works with corporate comics anyway. You can't go. I have this really great idea, and now I'm writing Captain America. How do I force that idea into Captain America? I mean, it may work, but you know, ideally, what you're going to ask yourself when you're writing Captain America is what kind of Captain America stories can I tell, and hold back your other material that you know could be something that you could develop into a property for yourself. Uh, you know, so that you can make that uh, you can make that money if it becomes successful. So, Aaron, do you have any final words on just creating relationships in the industry? You know, is it worth it? I hear a lot of things happen at Comic Cons outside of the convention scene where people go to the after hours parties, and maybe that might not be the scene for everybody. It kind of feels like it might be a place to get in trouble. It's definitely a place to get in trouble. If here's the problem with with comic the Comic Con after scene is you're dealing with a bunch of, of socially awkward people who, in general, are very lonely. 
and not very good with the opposite sex and all are, and are being treated like celebrities and there's booze involved. So those are, <laughs> that, that is a disastrous combination, mm. uh, you know, for, for people who are, you know, well adjusted to regular daily life, uh, which, you know, a lot of comic creators aren't, uh, but you know, people like my, myself who, uh, you know, dabble, but don't, uh, you know, <laughs> are not trying to uh, be a full-time uh, comics creator. Uh, it's a little bit easier because you've been in other social situations. You know how people are supposed to act. You know, you know how to treat people with dignity and respect. And, uh, you know, that, that if you can, if you feel confident in that, then you can go to those events and know that you're not going to get in any trouble because, you know, you have a certain standard of behavior. But, uh, you know, it's it's rough. It's rough because you don't know, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. And there's a lot of people uh, who are looking to use each other. And uh, then, you know, when it doesn't go the way that they want, they'll, they'll come back later and, and try and get you. So I think that uh, just as, as a new creator, if you don't think you can handle it, is it worth burning a bridge or potentially losing a potential relationship with an editor? They say, Hey, why don't you come up with this uh, with us to get some drinks? Do you think that'll hold you against you? If you're like, nah, drinks aren't my thing. I'm not coming. I mean, hopefully they won't. It just I guess it just depends on the personality and it depends on what their uh, what their actual goal is. If they respect you and they respect your talent and they actually want to work with you because of that, uh, then I think that you can you can beg off, uh, you know, pretty easily and, and it won't hurt you. But, you know, the, the honest truth is if they're a sleazeball and you're, you know, you're a cute member of the opposite or preferred sex that they're trying to romance with the, uh, you know, the possibility of work, uh, you just have to be really savvy to to tell the difference of whether you're being set up in a predatory situation or not and, and that's not just in comics that's that's in all life because you know people are uh pe people can be awful so you, you just have to you have to keep your guard up and and if you can i definitely recommend uh, especially if you you know you feel vulnerable or you feel uncomfortable uh you know get yourself a confident wing person to go with you uh you know to watch your back keep you out of trouble and uh you know step in if, if anything uh starts to happen that you're uncomfortable with mark have you ever been out to the com convention scene at the after hours party you notice somebody keeps sending a couple of dub double whiskey sours your way, trying to take advantage of you? <laughs> Buy a girl a drink? Yeah, right. No. So I'm 35. I feel like I'm way too old to be going and, and doing the, the, the cocktail party scene after cons, you know? So like what Tim and I do is like if there's – we meet people at the con, you know, we're, we're usually um, – if we're not in artist alley, we're usually in the guests um, area, and we meet the people next to us or the people across from us, and we make friends with them. Um, they're usually people our age or older um, who don't want to party either, who don't want to go to the rave at the end of the con because uh, we're way too old for that. And after the con's over, we'll go out and we'll get dinner at a local place. You know, maybe we're only bringing one or two um, people that we met at the con with us, but we're making a stronger relationship with those people. And it doesn't really matter if they can or can't do anything for us. That's not the point. We're just um, like, we just talked to them all weekend and we had a great time talking to them. We want to get to know them. So we go out and we hang out and have a, have a good dinner at one of the local places. Um, oh, a lot of times, uh, yeah, like the strip club. You know, we, we get a lot of singles. You know, at the uh, when people pay mostly with ones when they're buying our books from us, so we got to do something with them, right? Um, no, and so yeah, we, we if we get if we up in a hotel. Um, We'll have, uh, you know, a lot of the times the hotel will have the uh, the after con party, you know, where there's like the big rave over in, in like the, the the ballroom, whatever they have there, or down in the lobby with the bar, and we'll just kind of like circumvent that. And we've we've seen a lot of like the celebrity guests and a lot of people down there at the bar. There's one one year, I think it was um, Alamo City Comic Con, where we uh, we went down there and we we uh, we saw Vern Troyer sitting on a stack of phone books at the bar, and he just. Poor Vern Troyer. Um, someone took a photo of him, but left, but left the flash on and just lit up the whole room. And <laughs> Vern Troyer's like, hey, <laughs> he looked like they just took a photo of a leprechaun. Um, but yeah, we, we've done that. We just don't we don't go to those places. Maybe, yeah, we're not networking with the big corporate people, the sleazeballs, but we don't really want to network with the sleazeballs because that's and where uh, that's where everybody gets me too. And we, yeah, <laughs> and don't, we don't need that. You don't need to uh, with with your model and what you and Tim are doing and, and making it on your own. I mean, you guys don't really need that. It, it just depends on whether people want to work in, in corporate comics or not. And, and I know that like I'm heavily recommending against it at this point. Uh, but, uh, you know, people still have that passion. And, and if they they want that, I want to be able to help them. But just, you know, be on your guard because it's it's getting better because, you know, a lot of things about the way people have been treated have, have come out. But you got to remember a lot of the people that are condemning those people were a party to it and you know what they're you know they they turned a blind eye they didn't see anything wrong with it at the time but now that it's fashionable to come out against it and uh you know actually uh you, know, you kind of want to protect your career by coming out against it you know the people that supported it before 
are now uh, now talking about it. So you know, you, you just you, you got to just be really careful with people. Uh, you know, especially if you're you're young and naive and, and kind of like an introvert, you know, there are people out there that will try to take advantage of you. So definitely, uh, definitely keep yourself safe. Bring bring some people with you to look out for you. And I want to say thank you to Anointed Lore Comics for supporting the channel. Love the content. One of my favorite comic channels. Thank you very much. I appreciate the fist bump. And uh, hopefully we continue creating content that you enjoy. The last com Comic Con I went to, Aaron, I took Boom. If you know who Boom was, he's in the Philippines. He's like a motivational speaker kind of I thought you meant the entire comic company. I was like, man. No, no. <laughs> Boom. When you roll, you, Boom. Roll, you roll with an entourage. He's a Filipino dude that loves comics. He, he's like a motivational speaker. We went to TGI Fridays. That was our after party. Oh, big spender. <laughs> hey, listen, I <laughs> it's was, in the I Philippines. Was, it's not U.S. price. They got to import all that stuff. Come last on. <laughs> time I was in, uh, I was in, uh, it was either Seattle or Portland. Uh, went to Cheesecake Factory with Aaron Lepresti. So, you know, we were. Uh... <laughs> Boom. I keep meaning to invite Aaron onto the show. He seems like a really nice guy. He's and a really uh, good guy. Uh, I've been to dinner with him and, and Jerry Dodson, which is always fun because they give each other a hard time. Uh, you know, they're they're both, uh, you know, and Rachel Dodson is lovely and, and Aaron's wife is love. God, they're just they're, they're great people. So, they're, you know, I don't mean to like I know that like earlier I sounded kind of down, like watch out. There's predators everywhere. But, uh, <laughs> there are some genuinely good, uh, you know, and uh, upstanding people in the comic book industry. Uh, but but like in life, you know, they're, they're fewer and far between. So you, you just got to you got to find them. Let's talk about customer networking. This is probably more important than professional networking, especially if you're going to go the route that Mark Pellegrini is doing. It sounds like Aaron Sparrow might be going down here in the not too distant future. Customer networking. Customers are the lifeblood of any creative endeavor. You need to build a relationship and engage your audience to ensure uh, you're providing them with the entertainment that they want. Connected readers become repeat readers and repeat customers are vital to success. Connected readers may not need to be enticed to come back, but they come back because they want to and they make for more frequent purchases. And the most important is they become advocates for what you're selling. Customer networking couldn't be more important, especially if you're gonna be doing the, the comic book uh, crowdfunding route. Uh, you definitely wanna be responding to positive and negative feedback, giving loyal readers more than they could have ever asked for. Give them a peek behind the curtain, let them in a little bit, let them know who you are, your likes and dislikes. Meet them in person if you can. If you're going to go to a con, let them know where you're going to be. Maybe do an after party. If, if you can meet these people in, pe in person, it will definitely mean a lot and help you create long-time repeat customers. And do not plan growth of your brand without your loyal customers in mind. Don't try and leave them behind because that is not going to work out for you. And always thank your customers. What do you think about that, Mark? Well, I mean, you have nothing to gain by being rude to your customers. Um, and you have everything to lose. So why would you? I mean, I worked um, before, you know, I, I got a, I, I worked retail for 10 years before I, I got the current like daytime job that I have now. And so I had to learn customer service and I had to be nice to customers. You know, even even when customers are being rude to you, you know, you just be like neutral and nice to them. You have. But when customers come in and are polite to you, what do you have to gain when they say good morning and you say, yeah, whatever. Like what, what's that doing for you? Even if you're working retail at a Best Buy or a Blockbuster video where I worked, um, like why would you do that? You know, the, the thing that's gonna happen when you're rude to someone who's being polite to you um, is that they're gonna say like, all right, well, I'm never gonna shop here again because that one um, employee was rude to me. And hey, as a customer, maybe, you know, that one employee isn't gonna be there next week or certainly that one employee is never gonna be at that business if it's a chain and it's someplace far and you're going to a different location, but you'll always have that stigma about it. Like I went into the, one of these locations once, an employee was rude to me, so I'm never going to go back there ever again. And that's uh, sadly really equivalent with uh, crowdfunding in comics on um, like Indiegogo, Kickstarter, when you have all these people who put up their crowdfund comic and then they either don't fulfill it or they um, take three years past the deadline to fulfill it. And that sours that person's, that customer's um, attitude about crowdfund comics forever. And not just with that one creator, but with all creators. Like, wow, the first time I ever tried to uh, buy a crowdfund comic on Indiegogo, um, the creator uh, didn't give it to me for two years and I couldn't get a refund. I'm never um, crowdfunding or, or pre-ordering a comic on Indiegogo ever again. And now that customer is lost to everybody forever because one creator was a piece of garbage and, and uh, didn't take their deadlines and their promises seriously. Uh, you don't want to be that creator that ruins it for everybody else because guess what? You're part of everybody else. You're in that pool. You have nothing to gain from doing that. 
But what you have to gain from keeping your promises and from making your deadlines and from being polite to your customers is you make a customer potentially for life. You can make a friend. Um, you could network, like we're saying. You can make maybe that customer turns out that there's somebody who works in comics and has their own comic. And now all of a sudden, you know somebody um, who trusts you who works in comics. You can also, and also just having that public feedback of someone saying, I just pre-ordered this comic because I trust this guy and he's delivered on previous comics and the comics are great. That word gets out there and then you get more customers. You have everything to gain from being polite and personable and um, honest with your customers and everything to lose by you know being rude or just being a piece of garbage with them. Aaron, how how... I know you love customer networking. How much money have you made when you just bilk them for all they're worth for, for autographs and stuff? <laughs> I have never charged for an autograph, which is, is funny because people will ask me, and it, it, it was such a foreign concept to me uh, when people would first come up. They'd be like, well, how much do you charge to, to sign the book? I was like, I don't charge anything. You, you bought the book. Like, I, I you know, I, I'm appreciative. Give them more than they expected, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, I, I owe you. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign it for you, and I'm going to... I'm gonna doodle on it. And I'm gonna draw a character, and I'm gonna try and make them say something funny, and and uh, I'm gonna try and tell you a fun story about working on the book while you're standing here, and I'm doing that, and send you away happy. Like that's that's my philosophy. Is you came to see me, you bought my book. Thank you so much. You know, you are allowing me to do what I love by supporting me financially. Uh, I'm gonna you know try to give back. You know, right here now that you you've actually you physically come to meet me. That's 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 crazy. Um, I'm so appreciative of that. We did a uh, we did a con in uh, on Maui. Uh, it was like the first one of its uh, of its kind, and there was a an Italian woman who was a big fan of the uh, of the Darkwing books that we did, who flew out to meet us and to meet Tad. And I was like, wow, she planned her vacation. Like, I mean, she got to come to Maui. Don't get me wrong, but she planned, you know, her vacation, the timing of it so that she could go to this show and she should meet us. That That's huge. So when people tell me, like, I'm your number one fan, I'm like, well, have you flown from Italy to see me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Someone might have you beat. But I remember when, uh, when when Aaron gave me his autograph. It had his number on there. I was like, what the? <laughs> this know, is too much, mark, right? You've gone too far. <laughs> it was just in a con bar. Like, what is going on? <laughs> Uh, is there anything else that you do, Aaron, to just try and go above and beyond with your customers and let them know that they're appreciated so they'll keep coming back and maybe uh, and know that they are, they are wanted and loved? I try and be accessible. I know that uh, you know there is a certain arm's length that you have to keep because there are some people that will come in and make make requests. Uh, you know, and often they're autistic, so they don't they kind of don't know what the band boundaries are. That's something that I've learned on social media is that you'll get a lot of people who it'll seem like they're being rude or it'll seem like they're being demanding, and, and you're, you you know you kind of bristle at first because you're like, why is this person coming at me this way? But you know you kind of stop and you look at uh, you, know, you look over their history and you go, oh, you know I think they might be on the spectrum. They might not know you know, how, uh, how they're coming across. So it, it behooves you to be nice to everybody because you don't know what everybody's situation is. Uh, there's a saying that I, I think is really important in, uh, in, in business and in life that is just everybody's fighting a, a, war, a secret war that you know nothing about. And if you kind of keep that in mind, it, it makes you more compassionate towards people and it, 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 you give them a little bit more leeway. Uh, and, and you often find out that your initial impressions, if they're coming off as rude, that's not what they're intending to do. So uh, I, I think that's really important. But um, you know, I try to be accessible. I try to uh, I try to be open. You know, I genuinely like individual people. Um, you know, people as a whole, I'm not a huge fan of, but uh, you know, in mobs, but uh, you know, individuals, I really like. I'm, I'm a rugged individualist. Um, so I'll judge you on who you are as a person, not uh, who you associate with, not uh, you know what uh, what groups you identify with. You know, so I, I just try to treat everybody like people. I love customers. I love them coming up. I love talking about this stuff. Uh, you know, sometimes at a, at a long convention, like I'll apologize because I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm really tired. So if I seem like I'm, I'm not enthused, just know that it's because I've been doing this all day, you know, and I'm, I'm exhausted, but uh, I'm still really happy that you came to see me and, and to talk to you. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got, I've done shows with, uh, with artists that uh, actually have um, contempt for the customers and I don't understand it. And, and especially when you have people who are networking, you know, we have artists that come up and they show us their stuff and they want to talk to us. And, you know, Sol Solvani and I, we try to be really opening, you know, it's like, Hey, we're going to dinner. You know, if you guys seem cool, you know, if you want, you want to talk, you know, you can join us for dinner. You know, we, we try to be really accessible like that. And there were people who were like, I don't know why you're inviting, you know, inviting these people, these hangers on. <laughs> and my attitude was like, who the hell are you? Like, what do you mean hangers on? You know, like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you paid for dinner? Bias. You know, <laughs> you, you comic books, you, you draw art. You're very fortunate. 
You're not a celebrity. You are fortunate that you have a talent that people are willing to pay you for and you need to be appreciative of it. So, <laughs> Well, I mean, I got a, just a quick anecdote from the con that Tim and I did last weekend, uh, Saline County Comic Con in Benton. Um, so we have our Walmart books on the, on the table alongside our Common America and our Black Ops books, right? And Walmart's our, our political parody series with Trump as like an anime character. What, Trump? Um, <laughs> Trump, oh my God. You know, and we get that. We, we get people, we get... 90% of the people who walk up to our booth, our booth and see Walmart, they, they laugh and they'll, they'll like nudge their friend like, hey, check it out. And they'll laugh. And we don't know if they're laughing at it or with it. And we don't care. A lot of times they buy the book just because they, they think it looks ridiculous. And we don't care what their political spectrum is. Occasionally, we'll get the person who looks at it and shakes their head and like walks away. Um, or we very rarely get someone who like looks at us and, and tells us that we're abhorrent, you know, that they hate our guts because we did that comic. Um, usually people keep their criticism to themselves or b with their, their family or friends who is with them. And this weekend, this past weekend, um, we had a husband and wife come up and they're looking at our stuff. And they're looking at, at all of our art and, and smiling. And then we, we greeted them. We talked to them for a little bit. And they got to the end of the table with Walmart on it. And they looked down at it. And the wife, you know, she turned to her husband and pointed at it and shook her head and said, disgusting. You know, and I, I'm standing right there, but she didn't say it to me. She said it to her <laughs> husband. You know, I'm standing right there and just kind of like, oh, OK, <laughs> you know, um, I just kind of laugh. You know, we get that a, a lot, you know, and then, so they left. But I didn't when they when she looked at her husband and went disgusting. You know, I didn't look at him like, hey, well, up yours, uh, buddy. You know, I, I didn't get into a fight with them. I just kind of smiled, nodded, and like whatever. And 15 minutes later, they came back. And they bought a print from us. Um, it was a My Hero Academia print. And they, you know, they, they bought something from us, even though they thought that our Walmart book was disgusting. And they said that between themselves. If I had, when they said that, if I looked at them and said like, hey, you know, well, you can go get effed, you know, and, and just blew up at them, they wouldn't have come back and bought a print from us. If but you because don't like I was my polite, political <laughs> parodies, then don't buy my comics. Right? Why don't you go to Barnes Noble and get a Ocasio Cortez uh, autobiography? You stupid, like whatever. No, and so guess what? We still got a sale from the person. They don't like our Trump books, but they certainly like Tim's art, and they bought one of his, their prints. But that happened because we didn't blow at them, blow up at them, just because they were critical of one of the books on our table. So you know, just just be nicer than the person that you're getting angrier at, and maybe you'll benefit from it. <laughs> I mean, and not everything you do is going to be to everybody's tastes, and that's okay. You know, to art is subjective, and people's opinions are you know wide and varied, and and the things that they like are wide and varied. And if they don't like your thing, that's that's all right. All right. Well, let's talk about growing that audience. Once you've reached them, you found them, and you maybe you got a little audience like Mark Pellegrini and Tim Lim do, or like Aaron Sparrow and, and Silvani have. Uh, the larger your fan base, the more support and advocates that you're going to have for your work. So large, engaged fan bases open opportunities for creators and allow them to take risks they normally wouldn't be able to take and also allow allows creators to stay ahead of natural customer attrition. So you need to always be trying to grow your audience you know, in theory. So some of the things that you can do for this, this is certainly something that Mark does. Be entertaining. Use humor to engage people. Find groups and forums your target audience use and engage them there. Post, uh, once again, work in progress photos and commentary. Share peer content. If you have a peer that's doing something similar, share that out there. Let, let people know that you guys are kind of working in the same atmosphere. And hopefully you'll be able to uh, you know, project each other out there and maybe boost each other's signals. Uh, create a mailing list if you can. Recommend comics that you like. That way people get a good feel for what you're doing. But this is it's really important to grow your audience. You know, Obviously, Mark, with the, the success you guys have had at Common America and Black Ops, you know, you're growing your audience every single book. Yeah. Um, right now, uh, Common America, well, Black Ops X Common America is up for six more days on Kickstarter, and we're at 1,995 backers. Uh, we're, I'm certainly going to break 2,000 before uh, the final week is over. And, yeah, we've, we've been growing with, with each uh, book that we've done, and it's been a long road of three years' worth of crowdfunding. But uh, all that, I honestly, you know, we have our obviously our customers to thank because obviously we, without customers, we don't really have sales. We don't really have a book. Uh, but most of that is just from people who, who like the work that we do. I mean, certainly most of those 2000 customers, we probably don't even talk to on social media. They don't know us at all. They just like the stuff that we put out. But if they do go on social media and look up who we are and what we're saying and what we're doing, and if they do choose to interact with us, um, it's always a nice experience. Uh, we certainly don't, um, even if they say something critical or something negative at us, you know, we just ignore that. 
Um, if they say something critical with um, sincerity, you know, um, as constructive feedback, then we'll engage with them and, and talk with them. I'm like, well, okay, we understand. And we get that sometimes. If it's a troll, then it's a troll, and they're probably not buying our book anyway. Uh, but we generally just don't get into these adversarial uh, social media relationships, and I think that's benefited us a lot. Aaron, one thing that's important is if you're going to go into these forums and groups and you have a product, you don't want that to be the first impression you make. You want to go in there, engage with them, and show them that that you're there to be part of the community, not just to sell them your work. Yeah, you don't want to be a shill. Uh, you know, I, I don't recommend going into spaces, uh, you know, that uh, you don't plan on engaging with, uh, you know, honestly and and uh, enthusiastically. You know, I, I don't recommend that you go into those spaces and start trying to shill your book. You know, like find people who have like interests, find things that you're, you know, they're excited about the same things you are. You know, for me, it would be like going into like Disney forums. I like Disney characters. I like a lot of the work that Disney produces uh, that has produced over the years. Uh, so, you know, I'm already a fan of it, you know, and part of the thing with, with uh, Darkwing is I'm a huge fan of Darkwing. So I brought that to the table so I can go into a group and I can engage with them about their favorite episodes and, you know, their favorite things about the character and never talk about, you know, what I've done with the character at all. Uh, you know, I can engage them on that level. So, you know, again, I think it boils down to sincerity. Uh, Mark, I just wanted to tell you, uh, as you were saying that, you reminded me that there's only six days left for Black Ops XCOM in America. And so I went to Kickstarter uh, so that I could get my pledge in. And uh, when I was typing it into the search bar, uh, it changed it to Karen America. So I think that you have a, uh, you have a very good, uh, please, please take that and run with that if you, if you so desire for, uh, you know, their own... Uh, <laughs> We we do get that a lot. So we actually were we're joking about that. Like if we did create um a Karen a character named Karen America, that would be funny right now, but it would only be funny for as long as the whole Karen meme lasts. And then fifteen years from now people will be like, Oh, oh that's right, there was a meme about Karen's back in the day. Oh how droll, how quaint. <laughs> oh, Twitter exists. I don't think we're ever gonna be rid of Karen's now. <laughs> No, 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 they'll, they'll be they'll called something else. They'll be called yeah. Megan's next. <laughs> Lucy's, goes. Lucy's, Lucy Van <laughs> that horrible. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you, do you have any other good uh, tips on how you've grown your audience, Mark? Has it just been you know, that winning personality, or if you had to work for it? I mean, I don't think people necessarily follow us for our winning personalities because that's not how I describe our personalities. Um, I think it's just been work ethic. I think um, it's reliability that uh, we put out three books a year, we make our deadlines, the quality of the books are up to a level that people are willing to pay money for and that they enjoy them. Um, and I think that that's what it comes down to is that we, we say that we're going to produce a book of so many pages with such content by this deadline, and we do. And so people trust us and that keeps them coming back because the majority of our customers don't necessarily interact with us on social media. And not everybody we interact with on social media is a customer. A lot of them are just friends and people we know. And we don't we don't care if they don't buy our books. That's fine because we like talking with them. Um, so really, it just comes down to getting your books out on time and putting them up to a professional quality and keeping your promises. You're at 94,000. That's pretty impressive. What was the first uh, Common America Black Ops book? Oh, geez. So that, um, the first Black Ops book was um, Black Ops 2 Hair Trigger on Indiegogo. And I think that one did like 12K. Uh, I think the first How one many was Walmart 2. Um, let me look it up real quick. Uh, Indiegogo. It certainly wasn't 2000. Black Ops 2. Yeah, let me look that up. So that is Black audience Ops, growth. Yeah, so Black Ops on Indiegogo. Um, we didn't do a Kickstarter on that one. So Black Ops yep. on Indiegogo did 14,459. Um, and now Black Ops X Common America is, is doing 94K. Uh, but that was three years worth of, of hard work and building up customer trust. And let me just look up the first um, Common America real quick, because Common America that won. That one did much better. Um, yeah, it did better, um, but nothing like the numbers that we've been getting um, on current Common America books. Mm -hmm. um, so Common America won on uh, Kickstarter did... 20k so uh that so we went from black ops 2 making uh 14k to common america 1 making 20k and now we're at black ops x common america making 94k um which was just three years of hard work keeping our promises and building consumer trust 
And you've done this without having to uh, kiss anybody. You have a YouTube way. channel. <laughs> yeah, well, well we you have a YouTube, but you don't use it like other people do. No, we, we, we don't do the internet blood sport thing, and we, we don't kiss any rings, and we don't bow to anybody. We just do our thing, and the only people that we're out to impress are our customers, and uh, hopefully we've been How many, on how many deadlines did you miss on your crowdfunding, Mark? None. Uh, not on any of the ones that I've been a part of. <laughs> the only one I know of was um, Space Force. Oh, yeah, that was um, um that was Chuck you. Dixon and uh, Chuck and Dixon, Timothy yeah. Lim. That was the very first one that Tim did, and I believe that he was only late by one month, and it was because uh, technically the book was done. It was the patch. The book was done. It was one of the uh, add-ons. It was for the it action the figure. Um, that's yeah, the the add-on for the Trump, the space Trump action figure. The person who was um, producing those um, was running late on them, and so the the book was late by one month because um, those uh, were still in production. Um, but we that was the very first one we ever did, and it was only late by or Tim did, and it was only late by one month and no book. And we learned our lesson to make sure that all of our add-ons and special additional things are all produced in advance, just like our book is produced in advance. So we're never waiting on anybody to um, produce one of those things for us. So we always have our acrylics, we always have our masks and our trading cards and our posters and everything all ready and waiting to go alongside the comic before we launch the campaign. Um, so we are going to have questions from, from the viewers. So if you have a question, you can start putting them in there. Now we're going to wrap this last section up and then we'll, we'll have uh, questions and stuff like that from the viewers. Aaron, what do you think about growing your audience? Is that, that was a pretty impressive display by Mark and Tim, right? No, it absolutely is. I, I think that, uh, you know, they've, they've done it right. I, the independence that they have, not having to bow down to anybody, not having to be connected to anybody who is going to say something stupid that then they're going to have to defend. You know, they're responsible for themselves. Uh, and I think that that is, uh, is spectacularly the way to do crowdfunding. You know, it's okay to have, uh, it's okay to be friends with people, but, uh, you know, just because I'm friendly with people doesn't mean that I've signed their manifesto. And unfortunately, <laughs> in, in, uh, in the current comic market, that's, that's kind of how it's seen. It's like, you talk to so-and-so, that means that you believe everything that they believe. No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that at all. Uh, you know, it just means that I'm friendly with people and that I can find common ground even with people that I disagree with on many, many subjects. Uh, so, you know, growing your audience is the single most important thing that you can do. It's something that the mainstream has forgotten. They've developed this attitude, uh, a lot of the artists and writers, that their customer is the publisher. And that means that they can treat the end user of the product that they're making like shit. Uh, and that is completely untrue we have we've seen that you know i have people as i have people that order from our shop that have pull services and man a creator will go off on some tear on twitter and i on over the weekend and on monday i'll come in and i'll have five emails of people telling me cancel this creator's books from my pull well i'm still three months out on those books that i've already pre-ordered so now i'm stuck paying for those books that i'm not going to be able to sell because oh. some creator couldn't keep their damn mouth shut uh, you know, or, or just treat people with dignity and respect. They insulted the customer, you know, that they may not see that as their customer, but it is their customer and it's my customer and I am their customer. So they are screwing me as a, you know, somebody who's ordering comics. Uh, so, you know, it, customer networking is the single most important thing that you can do. You're asking people to spend their hard earned money on a commercial product that you have made. That is, you know, you are in the customer service business. All right. So do either of you have anything else to say about uh, the, the topic at hand? And we'll, we'll get into viewer questions. No, I'm good. <laughs> All right. Let's do it. Let's get into the viewer questions. There's a few of them in here already. I saw this one from Common Sense. I don't think this one's really for you guys. Maybe it's for me. Well, I mean, you both have YouTube channels. Let's put that out there. Dapper Dragon Media is Aaron Sparrow, and the Bunder Dome is a collaborative effort between Mark Pellegrini and Tim Lynn. This is from Common Sense. I want to make reviews on comics I like. That's good networking, right? Absolutely. Telling people what kind of comics you like, getting the word out there that you're interested in comics certainly is going to build up a network. People are going to come find you, and it turns out you're going to like the same comics and stuff like that. That's how you kind of build you can build relationships. That's somewhat how I've done it here with my channel and, and met people. Maybe not specifically through the, through the reviews, but just through the content I make. Sadly, I don't know how to make videos, and I don't have a microphone. There's nothing that says to do a comic review, you have to do a video. You can write up reviews. You can make your own website. You could do mini reviews on Twitter. You could post reviews on Facebook. There are other platforms where you can do your own comic book reviews, come up with your own you know, uh, way that you want to do them. You, you know, one cover, you know, maybe two extra pictures or whatever. Break it down how you want to you know, come up with your own format. 
and get your get your reviews out there. And you will start some people will start coming to you for that information because people love comic book reviews because there are so many bad comics out there they don't want to waste their money right now. Right, Aaron? Absolutely. No, I I, uh, <laughs> I think that uh, you know now reviewing comics, um, you know, it's it's something that's fun to do. I find it interesting. I like watching uh, you know Wes's reviews. I like watching reviews by other guys that are out there um, because uh, you know I, I can't I can't read everything, so I like to know what uh, you know what people are recommending and, and why they're recommending it. So I think that you jumping into that, uh, you know, you've got a lot of ways that you can do it. You can do it on your phone. You know, you don't necessarily need a microphone. Your audio won't be the best, but you know, I don't think that you have to do that to start out. You know, you just. I I've seen a person with an 80,000 subscriber YouTube channel do it on their phone. Yeah. Exactly right. <laughs> I mean, so I had that Ninja Turtles website um, where I reviewed Ninja Turtles comics, TMNT Entity, and I ran that for 10 years before I just um, before I started publishing my own comics and didn't have time to run it anymore. Um, and just people my, know who my you are because of it. Yeah, um, they, they, uh, a lot of people hate me because of it. <laughs> a lot of people at IDW <laughs> hate me because of it, even though I, I was... I'd say I was 85% positive in my reviews of IDW comics, but it's always that 15% negative that makes you an enemy for life. Uh, but it, my, I actually suggest for people who are just starting out trying to get into comics and they just need to practice, like it helps you. If you write every single day, you get better at something. So just writing anything will help you out get better. You'll improve your vocabulary but you'll also improve your critical skills. It's one thing to look at a comic and you'll know if you like it or not. If you watch a movie, you'll like it or not. But it's important to break it down and think critically and articulate why you like it or why you don't like it. I look at the earliest reviews I wrote on my Ninja Turtles comic and it was like Beavis and Butthead wrote them like, huh, it sucks because it sucks. Then I look my at the ones that I wrote 10 years so later. Oh. Right? Yeah, it's so bad, hard going TV looking at TV my is. old stuff, being like, oh, that's that's terrible. But then I look at the, the reviews that I wrote, you know, 10 years later, and they're just like these multi paragraph essays where I break down what I really enjoyed about it, why I really enjoyed it, or what I didn't like about it, and why I felt it, it, it fell short of my expectations. And that's all just stuff that I learned over 10 years of thinking critically about what I was consuming and why I liked it and why I didn't like it. And then you, if you become a writer later on, you apply what you've learned. Like, okay, I like um, the way this story is paced because it is paced in this specific way. Maybe I'll apply that to what I'm writing. Or I like the dialogue pattern in this, but maybe I'll apply that. Or I don't like this. Maybe I'll try to avoid doing it that way. Um, it's, it's very educational. So I do recommend reviewing stuff. Absolutely. And I want to say thank you very much to Joe Brent for, for supporting the channel. $20 is very generous. A great show, great info. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We, we really enjoy doing these. Uh, I'm not sure how much longer this is going to go. Uh, hopefully through perhaps through the end of the year. We'll, we'll see how many more episodes, but we absolutely love doing these. And if, if it ends up finishing, we might have to talk about old movies or something. We got to keep doing this, guys. So <laughs> yeah. thank you very much, Joe Brett. We've also got Marigo and how do you grow your audience even when it seems just one person sees anything you do and if you're introvert? Aaron, it, it always feels like you're not getting not, not enough people are engaging. More people are going to see what you're doing than you realize. And if you just got to keep doing it. That's the key. If you want to be a content creator, you got to create content, whether it's comic book writing, whether it's videos, you know, whatever you're going to be doing. Yeah, you. It, it's tough. It's got to be tough for for introverts uh, to put themselves out there. Um, like I said, I, I don't really understand what that's like because I'm not introverted. But uh, you know, I, I understand that it must be hard. Uh, you know, there are more people that are going to be, you know, have eyes on the thing that maybe aren't going to communicate with you, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, uh, because maybe they're introverts, too. But, uh, you know, I, I think that it is important if you want to move forward to try and break out of your shell as much as possible. You know, you can still be very guarded. And I, and I do recommend that in a lot of situations to be very guarded. But, uh, you know, to kind of like develop skills, you know, and some comfortability and getting out of your shell and talking to people. And, you know, as long as you're sincere, you know, people will respond to that, you know, whether, uh, you know, you're a little bit more uh, introverted or not so i mean that's the best I could, advice i can offer there yeah if you're gonna make I mean, a comic and you do crowdfunding you're gonna have to sell it you're gonna have to talk about it so there's no time yeah. better than right now to start getting those those skills developed and honed yeah the do hustle it like is a, the hardest do, part yeah. yeah do it like uh, do it like acting sit in front of the mirror and, and re kind of rehearse mm -hmm. You know, talking, practice, having a conversation, you know, just just get kind of comfortable with that. And then, you know, you can start doing it with people that you're close to, you know, uh, have them kind of interview you. Uh, you know, that's a good way to kind of like develop those skills as well. Absolutely. We've got fleezes. 
How do you feel about using those Kickstarter promo sites that charge like 150 bucks and stuff like that? How do you feel about that one, Mark? Uh, he also so, tells that, do those promo sites actually work or should I go with giving out free promotional comics with flow codes in the back with a link to Kickstarter after a, a photo scan? So that's, that's the hardest one because we used to boost our posts on Facebook and we would get, you know, like, ooh, like uh, 10,000 views. It would cost us like 100 bucks. We get like, ooh, 10,000 views. And we get like all these followers like, ooh, we just got 100 new follower accounts. And we go and look at those accounts and they're all um, zero pictures, zero name, zero detail. Uh, all of them had, you know, like one view. Uh, they were all bot accounts that Facebook had created. Um, no actual living human beings were um, actually seeing all of our boosted posts. It was just money going into Facebook's pocket. And then a year later, suddenly we would notice uh, our follower count suddenly drop by the exact amount of people who followed us in the previous year because Facebook was deleting all of its bots. It's the Facebook boost is all just one big scam. And we learned that the hard way after throwing money at them and finding that um, it wasn't actually boosting our posts to any other human beings. Uh, I So that that um, gave me a lot of distrust towards boosting posts. Now there have been times where we found that it does work. Uh, over on Minds, which we did, we're still building up our presence on Minds, but uh, they have a token system that allows you to earn tokens um, the more you interact with the Minds platform. And then you can use those tokens to boost your own posts. And that actually works because it actually does get them out to, to people. Um, the first thing you see when you log into Minds is the boosted post uh, link. Um, so you can uh, see how people are finding your stuff. And we have gotten more followers that are actual accounts from actual human beings through boosting our posts. That works. But it's also on Minds, which is a brand new social media platform. So um, you know, you're, you're not looking at the same uh, pool of people that you see on, on you know, Kickstarter or, or Twitter or places like that. Um, uh, I think just they can work, but do your research first. Um, find out from other people who do use it if it actually is benefiting them. Um, Tim you think you should the, give away comic books for free. I don't think you should ever give away something that you want to get paid for. Uh, I would say that don't go through the expense of printing it out yourself. I say that you can always put um, a digital sample out online, which is going to meet more people than anything you'd print um, uh, ever would. Like just do like a six page preview of your comic or something like that. I mean, when I post it, when I publish a book on Amazon, they put like the first chapter, you know, as a, um, you know, a read this to see if you like the book. Um, I don't have a choice on that. Just this, that's what Amazon does. But it lets people read the first chapter of my book and see if they do like it. You make it or sure not. the cha first chapter is three pages. <laughs> yeah, that's right. What I would do. Well, no, they, <laughs> they, they, they do, I say the first chapter. What they do is they have a mandatory number of pages, which usually oh. always amounts about the first chapter or so, first chapter and a half. Um, but yeah, it, it's to allow people to preview your product and see if they like it or not. And I still sell books. So people read that um, that preview and decide that they like my work enough to want to pay for it. Same thing with comics. Um, there's a lot of people who do web comic versions of uh, their uh, published comic where you can go on, you can read the web comic. And if you like it, you can go and read the published version, which is usually a completely different story um, and then go and actually pay money for it. And I've done that before, too. Um, so, yeah, it's. Uh, putting a preview of your stuff out there, a sample for people to um, enjoy for free, uh, often will lead to more sales if you know if the product you're putting out is good. We've got this is uh, from Fizz Chozo. Do live streams actually work for networking if you can't make videos consistently? If you're going to do a live stream, when you, I was imagining you're talking about YouTube or Facebook, there are other platforms you can live stream. If you're not going to be on the exact same time. Like if it's once a week or, or twice a week, it will definitely you find it hard to find an audience, especially for the live streams, because people want to have get that interactive experience. But if they don't know when you're going to be on, you, you know, it's going to be hard for them to find you. I know you do a lot of live streams um, on your channel. Do you, do you find that it helps you with networking as far as comic books, Mark? Oh, um, we don't update the Bunder Dome consistently enough for it to have really Im any impact. So I, I say I agree with you, um, Wes, that if you are going to have a YouTube channel, then you've, you've really got to build it and you've got to be consistent with it. Um, and we're the other side of the coin. You, got, you get like a thousand views on every video. Uh, Bunder Dome videos get like a hundred views of that uh, because we do them so infrequently and consistently. We don't really um, do anything with, with our, our Bunder Dome channel. Uh, we just kind of have it just to have it. Um, 
So, but Aaron, it, yeah. let's do something more regular on the Bunderdome. Let's let's do a let's do a legitimate <laughs> like we're coming in. We're all going to talk about this book. Three men enter, one man leaves. <laughs> all right, Aaron. So you have a channel of your own, but you don't really do live streams. Do you find it helps you for networking to go on other people's channels and get yourself out there and promoted? Well, the problem with my channel is it's just me, and I don't find that as interesting as I find having coming on and ha you know somebody else's channel and having somebody to play off of. So uh, you know, for a while I was thinking of like a co-host, but the logistics of it you know just became really difficult, and and then the person that I had in mind just uh, just up and vanished. So <laughs> listen, it's, uh, you know, it's, if you uh, need a wingman. But then I can just come on here. You've already you've already built up the uh, you've already built up the audience. I can come on here and we can chat and uh, and so uh, you know my channel. I may do something uh, as we start to uh, move towards crowdfunding a book. You know I, I'll I'll want to schedule some regular things so people can come on and ask questions and I can show progress and things like that. But yeah, right now it's just a small channel. It's mostly got like some toy reviews that I did uh, with my bearded dragon uh, causing havoc in the background. And, bearded uh, dragon, huh? Yeah, I had a bearded dragon for a while. He passed away last year, unfortunately. Sad. I'm sorry. And, uh, you know, I just I'm not ready. To, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to love again. I'm not ready to have another pet. <laughs> but uh, so we, you know, we and, do and, have uh, like some uh, some convention appearances on there where, where like panels were recorded. So the most recent video and probably the most viewed one is uh, me with a bunch of the voice actors from Darkwing Duck uh, doing a panel at uh, I think it was TuneCon. So uh, you know, tune in and uh, check them out. Uh, you know, because th th they were a lot of fun. So we've got L. Kim Lo C. How exactly do you get your comics printed and shipped to backers when working on a campaign? How do you do that, Mark? Oh, one second, let me look again. So how do we get our comics printed and shipped to backers? So uh, that's Tim something Lim you want to get. Oh, yeah, that, that's <laughs> Tim. You know, it's all on him. No, um, that's something you want to figure out before you even launch your campaign or when you're even considering your campaign at the beginning you want to everyone who's a creator you know if you're a writer or an artist you know how to write you know how to draw um do you know how to print do you know where to go to print do you know how to ship them how to get them out um you got to figure all that stuff out uh, before you even really seriously start to consider um putting stuff up on crowdfunding we've known a lot of people who um, launch their crowdfund, and then we ask them well how are you um, planning on uh, printing and fulfilling and they're like oh we'll figure that out later and then when they try to figure it out later, ooh, they find out that the quote for printing is much more than they anticipated, and then the quote for fulfillment is even more. And now they got to pay out of pocket, or a lot of the times, like, I may have oh, saved I'm fatal J on that one. Yeah, um, and you'll notice that a lot of times, like, oh, well, we'll just um, put this book into in-demand status on Indiegogo for the next two years while we try to um, earn enough money to actually pay for the uh, printing and fulfillment that we didn't anticipate costing that much. These people who didn't, you know, put that stuff um, into consideration, they only thought about the creative side of things. Uh, so we figure all that out first. We have um, AIP uh, in Tennessee who prints all of our books for us, and they can do all. If we have um, like a hollow foil cover, a holographic cover, a shiny cover, of an embossed cover, we run all that through them. We get the quotes on all that from them first, um, before we even put it out there in our campaign as a possibility, as something that we're going to sell. We find out how much is this going to cost first before we actually uh, promote it or offer it. Um, and once we get that quote done, then, you know, we have our fulfillment company, which is Iconic Comics. And then we work all that out with them, what the cost of fulfillment is going to be. And then once we have all those quotes and all those costs down, that uh, tells us how much we're going to charge um, for our book or how much our, um, our, our, uh, full, our crowdfunding fulfillment minimum is going to be before we to make the crowdfund a success so that we can actually meet the expectations of, of cost so that we can publish it. But that's all stuff you want to figure out before you even launch your book, certainly before you launch your book. Um, it all goes into that. And uh, Marigo and how would you stay consistent growing your audience early in your project? Oh, is that for me or for Aaron? Well, Aaron really hasn't fulfilled a campaign yet, so I'm imagining oh. that's what they're talking about. Oh, okay. Um, stay consistent, in growing your audience, um, even early in your project. Uh, like I said, it's um, you, you use the operative word there, Marigo, consistency. Uh, your first uh, crowdfund, uh, you'll be lucky if you break even. Uh, we showed you uh, 14k on Black Ops 2, and I can tell you that, that broke even on all of our costs. Tim and I did not uh, take home any personal profits on that one. Um, but then we did our second one, which was Common America, and then that one made uh, 20k, and we had minimum personal profits, but most of the uh, money that we earned from that, actual 
um, earnings, not just uh, um, overhead coverage, we rolled that into our next book, which was uh, Common America 2. And then we rolled that into Common America 3. And then we rolled, we rolled that into Black Ops X Common America and so forth. Um, and we were able to offer our books now in hardcover, and we we're able to offer um, them at the same price, ten dollars plus five dollars shipping with a hardcover book. We we're able to out offer more um, extras like the soundtrack CDs and the masks and things because we take the money that we earned from the previous campaign and roll in the next one. But we're only able to do that because we're consistent. We get the three books out a year. We get them out on time. We meet our deadlines, um, and we're able to grow our base. So, like you said, consistency. All right, so I'm going to answer uh, two questions after this one. Uh, Alpha level, what do you think about people that criticize EVS for not sharing his platform for those who deserve it? Listen, my platform is minuscule in comparison to EVS's. I have put thousands of hours into making my YouTube channel the minor success that it is. I do not owe it to anyone. If you want to come on my channel and help me create content and talk about comic books, I will help boost your projects and whatnot. Otherwise, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I owe it to nobody. Because I have literally really worked hard for this, and it's my platform, and that's how I feel about it. Is that a, is that anyone else? What do you think about that, no, Aaron? I mean, Am I being unreasonable? No, I don't think that's unreasonable at all. You don't owe your platform to anybody. It's like somebody coming on and telling me that, oh, because you are a comic creator and you have a certain uh, number of followers, it's your responsibility to boost this political ideology. No, it's not. No, it's not. I don't, I don't have a responsibility to use my platform for anything other than I want to use it for. Uh, I don't have the, uh, you know, I don't have to have other people on. It's nice if I do it. If I do it, it's a courtesy, uh, you know, and I, I try to do it. I try to boost people's projects and things like that on my, on my social media uh, because I believe in doing it. But it's because that's what I believe. If I wasn't, wasn't comfortable with it, I wouldn't do it. And I don't think that anybody uh, owes it to anybody else. You know, if, if you want a platform, build your own. Uh, yeah, because, it's like inviting yourself it. to somebody else's birthday party. You know, it's like crashing exactly. a party. Like, hey, I, I, you have a nicer house than I do. I should be able to come in your house and have a party. Like, what? No, that's insane. Like, if you have a bigger platform, you know, you don't. Nobody can just invite themselves onto it. Uh, that you're not obligated or entitled to be on somebody else's platform just because it's bigger and and you want the exposure that they have. Uh, that's yeah. That's yeah. How many times I had to put myself out there and get rejected and and tell and be told that it wasn't worth their time? A lot. I earned this. Isn't <laughs> that the worst to go to Aaron Sparrow and him having to tell you to go pound sand? That's right. How, how, many, uh, how many viewers your channel? I'm not get out of you. here, you, you nobody. Wow. <laughs> I'll get Aaron Sparrow on the channel one day. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not talking about Aaron, but, but you know, you do go through those things, and it was a lot of hard work. So I will I share it as, as much as I can, but, you know, th this is a lot of hard work to, to grow and maintain, in my opinion. We got Marigo in with the, another question. We're going to throw this one up to uh, well, that guy right there. Right, there it is. How do you challenge your own imposter syndrome as a creator? Uh, you know, <laughs> I'll tell you when I really uh, started to feel imposter syndrome was the, even though we had already done it. Uh, we'd already done a Darkwing book. It, it was, uh, you know, it was written by me and, and then, uh, you know, largely credited to somebody else uh, who overwrote the dialogue. Uh, in, in, you know, a lot of the later books, but, you know, we had already done a successful Darkwing run, but it was the night before the second volume, the Joe Books volume of Darkwing that was supposed to hit the stands where I had an absolute freak out and I was calling friends who had read the script and I was like, it, it's good, right? You weren't just saying that, right? <laughs> and they're like, what are you talking about? It's good. You know, it's good. You know, you felt really good about it. Like last week, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, because it's about to go from my hands out into the hands of the world, out in, you know, out to the fans that are, that are anticipating it. And I was afraid all of a sudden, like, what if I was too close to this? What if I wrote a bad story? Uh, what if I, I'm about to let all these people down that are anticipating this? So uh, it's tough. I definitely understand, you know, getting that imposter syndrome. But, you know, you, you run it by people. You get good feedback from people that you trust. And even if you have those moments of doubt, you know, you've got to believe that, uh, you know, if you've got people that you trust that are going to be honest with you, you know, you know that they gave you, you know, their honest opinion and you know that the work is good. So, you know, even if you have those moments of self-doubt, in those moments, you can fall back on the people that you trust who told you, yeah, no, you did a good job. Crimson Crusader 93, what do you find is the best to get an artist's attention as a writer? How did you do it? 
do it, uh, Mark? Did you just throw? Did you have the oh. money? Did you just like? Woo! Did you make it <laughs> that's yeah, how, right. That's how, we, that's how we hooked Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Tim said, "Please stop. I'll, I'll draw your book. Just stop sending." No more news. <laughs> no more news. Just please. No, I mean, so I had the benefit of being friends with Tim. So, um, but I, I think that uh, money talks. So here's the thing is that if you're a writer and you're commissioning an artist to draw your book for you, money up front, uh, you have to be able to pay them out of pocket. Now you can say that, oh, I'll only pay you if the crowdfund uh, succeeds and then you'll get X number of dollars. That's not going to be as enticing to a new artist as like, I will pay you money. Here's the money. Please draw the comic. Um, you need to have the money ready to pay your artist is what I suggest. It's like any, when we commission art, um, you see uh, Tim and I posting all this art um, of common America and common victory, like one I posted today and et cetera, et cetera, of all of our characters. Sexy we commission robots. Both, um, yeah, cute, sexy robots, um, Genzo men, we ha uh, Kafun. We have all these wonderful artists who do the, these great pieces for us. We pay them up front to please produce the art for us. And it's and even though those are variant covers or pinups, that's no different than um, commissioning an artist to draw the interiors for your comic. You need to save up your money so that you can pay them to draw it. That also means that um, they're gonna take your, your commission seriously and meet the deadlines you put down for them. Whereas if you're just paying them with a promise of money, that's not gonna go as far as paying them with actual money. So be ready to pay the artist, um, and then you'll find that it's a lot easier to get work from them. All right, here's the last question. Because it's Dion, I love him so much. We do do one more that I wanted to. Aaron, could you answer this first part in, in like 20 seconds or less, and I'll do the second part. How do you maintain a healthy network of individuals you can trust while working in comics? Uh, you just have to, uh, you know, you have to be able to spot sincerity in people. You have to uh, under understand, you know, who's like-minded. And, uh, you know, you, you just have to kind of become a good judge of character is, you know, which isn't always easy. But, uh, you know, over time, you'll really start to develop that skill. And, uh, you know, it's like I, I trust the guys on this channel. They haven't steered me wrong yet. Absolutely. Also, have you uh, you have any thoughts on an episode involving mentorship? When I was writing up the syllabus for this, it was in, it originally included mentorship. And I realized that, the, that that topic was so enormous, it couldn't be fit into this. So there will be an episode on mentorship, not next week. Oh, wait, next week's Fourth of July weekend, guys. Are we doing this? Oh, that's a hmm. I mean, I, I, I I'm, I'm still game. I, I I can still do it. I'm game. Yeah, okay, I can do it um, Sunday morning. That should be a problem. All I right, promise Ace, you I'll be enough. sober. <laughs> if you want to talk, see some comic book writing and and stuff, maybe we won't specifically go into. Um, Whatever we'll talk about something. We'll be here live next week. We come on, we'll, got... come, we'll come on camera. We'll t we'll eat we'll eat uh, you know beef brisket and, and corn on the cob. Uh, we'll shoot some fireworks. Uh, you know we'll uh, we'll suffer a grievous injury and have to be rushed. You to the make boss. me look bad. <laughs> make me mad. <laughs> Miss America. So we'll all come on with our hangovers from the previous night. I'm like, ah, oh, Aaron, could you keep it down? My head hurts. Oh. <laughs> Alcohol is banned in the Philippines right now. Oh. Really? That's yes. an interesting topic. We could discuss that. It's COVID related. They it happens every once in a while. So I don't really drink anyway now that I've got three kids. Well, actually, I didn't drink when I had two kids. I just don't drink really now that I'm. <laughs> yeah, like what's the I'm threshold of, uh, of children in which you stop drinking? Two, three? Like oh, well, I'll I had wait one kid. I, I still kids, drink man. a little bit, but now that I once I had two, that was about it. So thank you very much to everybody, specifically Aaron and Mark, for joining me. Talk about networking, a very important skill. Something you're going to have to develop if you want to be successful in comic books, not only in the big two, but if you want to do crowdfunding, you've got to be able to network with your customers.